Now that we have discussed behaviorist viewpoint, how they try to explain personality, let us now talk about the proposition of Albert Bandura. Bandura is uh, very famous for his modeling concept. According to him, most of our learning is acquired through observation or modeling. So, what we do in our life is, as a growing child, we select a model, we pick and choose certain replicatory behavior of the model okay, and then we start imitating it. Therefore, what happens that we would you know, basically observe the performance, we would retain some of the uh, know, observed behavior and then we try to replicate it. Usually what happens in a social context, the elder members of the family, the society, they also appreciate, they uh, do pass remarks which gives a positive feed to the growing child that he or she has been successful modeling whosoever he or she is trying to imitate. So, this was a major uh, know, concept proposed by Albert Bandura and according to him, there are four processes which govern uh, the process of modeling, attention, retention, motor production and motivation. So, for modeling it is essential that we must attend to the behavior of the other person. So, this is the attention component. Okay. So, you exclusively pay attention to the model whom you have selected from your environment. Second, you observe the pattern of behavior that your model exhibits okay, and you basically try retaining the you know, symbolic image that you generate out of it. Okay. So, this is the retention part. You pay attention to your model, okay. you very keenly observe certain uh, key features and then you try to retain it. Third, when you start converting whatever you have retained, the symbolic retention, you start converting it into some cognitive representation into uh, appropriate actions. So, the manifested behavior is somehow you know, coming closer to the symbol that you had you know, retained uh, and this is how attention which helps you retain and retention when you succeed converting into an overt action that is the motor production part. And then of course, uh, there is a motive behind that. Okay. And this governs the entire process of modeling. Bandura also proposed two determinants of learning, the antecedent determinants and the consequent determinants. According to him, antecedent determinants they activate the person and guide the behavior of the given individual, whereas consequent determinants basically they maintain behavior after it has been triggered, after it has been activated. And there are of course, certain reinforcements that one gets, it could be external in nature, it could be vicarious in nature or there could even be a, an option of self produced reinforcement. External reinforcement basically they are obtained through certain direct experiences. Uh, as I was referring right now, know that the people in your family, the people in your society, they praise you, they appreciate you that you have been able to uh, replicate the behavior of your model. So, this is a praise, this is a external reinforcement. You receive certain reward in some other formats or for doing certain things, you receive a punishment. So, reward and punishment would be you know, the two sides of the same process of uh, you know, praise or the negative consequence of it. It could be materialistic in nature, it could be say you are being offered money as an award. Okay. So, all these constitutes external reinforcement. Vicarious reinforcement, they are basically based on our vicarious experiences. Uh, for example, learning through observation of consequences of others behavior. So, you do not have an experience, direct experience, rather you know that somebody else tried doing this and got positively or negatively uh, no, uh, rewarded by the community or other stakeholders in the society, in the family. And therefore, what you do? You learn from the consequence that the other person experienced. Say for instance, you realize that uh, responding in a particular way in a classroom or active participation in a classroom or usage of slangs is something that is uh, no, not appreciated. 
So, certain doable aspects, certain non doable aspects, you have not used it yourself, but you have seen that others who use slangs were punished. You saw that others who actively participated in the classroom sessions were rewarded and it is this reward and punishment that you have seen others receiving which in turn provides a reinforcement to you. This is vicarious reinforcement. There could be a third situation where there is self produced reinforcement. Every individual uh, is likely to set some standards for himself or herself and once you set the standard for yourself, you start behaving accordingly. Now, in such situations, you do not need any external reinforcement to maintain behavior. Why? Because you are trying to achieve the target, therefore, you do not need reinforcement. Okay. Your own uh, uh, process of matching with the standard template that you have set for yourself is fair enough for the maintenance of the behavior. Another concept proposed by him was of reciprocal determinism. Bandura said that environment causes behavior and behavior in turn also leads to the creation of certain type of environment and personality is basically an interaction among environment, behavior and persons psychological processes. Okay. So, this was uh, Bandura's viewpoint. So, what we have seen? We have uh, looked at the Freudian and the new Freudian viewpoint, we have seen the behaviorist viewpoint. And now we come to the humanistic viewpoint. We would talk about uh, two important uh, individuals and the concepts that they proposed. One Abraham Maslow and the other one is Carl Rogers. Abraham Maslow's theory is also called self-actualization theory. What he said was that human motives are basically innate and they are arranged in an ascending order of priority. Okay. So, there is a hierarchy of our need. If you look at your screen, there is a pyramidal shape. Okay. At the bottom, you have the physiological needs. Then comes the need for safety, need for belongingness, self-esteem and finally, is the stage of self-actualization. Physiological needs basically includes hunger, thirst, sex and sleep. These are the four physiological needs. Now, these are the needs which work in cyclic order. Okay. So, you satisfy the need, you were thirsty, you have a glass of water, okay. after some time once again the thirst will reappear, once again you will have to go for gratification of it. Same with all types of physiological needs. But then you realize that once to certain extent you have been able to satisfy your physiological needs, the need for safety arises. You want to uh, ensure that you are safe, you are secured okay. and it is not only that you only you are secured as an individual, but your belongings and those associated with you, they also know are safe and secured. Once need for safety is ensured to certain extent, there is a need for belongingness, okay, need for affiliation. You want that people should like you and at the same time you also develop liking for a set of people. Okay. So, this is the need for belongingness and thereafter comes the need for self-esteem. Okay. Now, what Maslow did was, he basically divided these uh, five stages okay, into two broad categories, the B motives and the D motives. Now, D motives are basically deficiency based motives, whereas the B motives or self actualization okay, which stands alone in this category is basically the meta needs. Okay. Now, deficiency motive basically means that you are able to uh, satisfy it to certain extent, but then you realize that there is a reappearance of that very need. So, D motives are basically you know uh, based on the deficiency uh, paradigm. You satisfy the need and then you realize that you have to redo it because whatever you have attained does not last long. Okay. Whereas, B motive the self actualization is not like that. Okay. It is based on meta needs, little later we will know uh, look at the exhaustive list of meta needs. Two interesting thing uh, Abraham Maslow proposed and 
basically he said that see these D motives they are essential for our survival, they are basically the survival needs, no? uh, even uh, the need to satisfy your uh, uh, physiological needs, safety, security, belongingness, okay? all of them they serve the purpose of survival. Even need for affiliation, love and esteem both are instrumental maintaining your mental health and as well as your physical health. Okay. So, they all serve the survival function. Now, all these needs okay, are basically genetic, the D motives are genetic, they are like instincts. Okay. And in fact, Abraham uh, Maslow went to the extent of using a word instinctoid, okay. instinct like this is what he meant by this word. Now, self actualization which is basically a B motive is basically a state which means to reach the peak of the potential that you have so that you become a completely fully functional individual. Okay. Now, need for self actualization is basically an umbrella that covers 17 different meta needs okay, or the being values uh, what Maslow says. Meta needs have no hierarchy uh, unlike the D needs okay, which were arranged in hierarchy and therefore, all meta needs are equally potent. For example, uh, need for perfection, need for beauty, need for richness, wholeness. Okay. Now, all these needs they are equally potent, you cannot arrange them in priority. And self actualization therefore, is not all or none process, okay. rather it is a matter of degree. So, you are perfect to what degree? Okay. It is not that either you are perfect or you are not perfect, that is not true in the case of self actualization, the B needs. Okay. Whereas, in the case of D needs, you are either uh, know, you have a given uh, physiological state, say for example, you are thirsty or you are not thirsty. Okay. But then in the case of meta needs, in the case of the being values, self actualization, okay, you realize that all of them are equally potent okay, and they rather only vary in terms of their degree. And of course, one of the humbling proposition was that no human being is actually perfectly self actualized. Okay. Now, the concept of steam that was proposed by Maslow is similar to what Adler said as you no know, striving for superiority or what Erickson said as need for mastery. You know. There is a resemblance. You know. So, the dynamic approach to personality which was you know, talking about striving for superiority or need for mastery of course, proposed by Adler and Erickson respectively. Okay, it is uh, now it is similar to the concept of uh, need for steam, self steam okay, proposed by Maslow. Now, here you find the list of meta needs. Okay. On the left hand side, you see the desirable meta needs, okay. whereas at the same time when you try to achieve the desirable thing, you also try to avoid the uh, no characteristics, the meta needs which are uh, no, uh, pen down on the right side of the screen. Say like uh, you consider truth to be a worthy characteristics, you would like to be remain truthful, you honor it, you respect it, you would like to have that in you, but at the same time you would also like to be away from dishonesty. Okay. You would like to imbibe goodness in you, but at the same time you will try your best not to be able. Okay. So, likewise the left and the right panels basically are you know, the two ends of the spectrum of a given continuum and these meta needs basically if you look at them they are you know, extremely, uh, extremely positively oriented, you know, truth, goodness, beauty, unity, wholeness and transcendence of opposites, aliveness, uniqueness, perfection and necessity, completion justice and order, simplicity, richness, effortlessness, playfulness, self-sufficiency, meaningfulness, all of them are positively toned. And therefore, when you try achieving these meta needs, okay, it is the degree to which you are able to sustain them. So, how truthful are you? Okay, that would be uh, know, the basic interpretation of these meta needs. And while you are trying to maintain certain degree of truthness in you, you ensure that you are not going to be dishonest. Okay. 
likewise. Now, the lower level needs that is uh, you know, the D needs which are more of physiologically oriented and safety oriented needs according to Maslow they are supposed to be satisfied okay, before the higher level needs they become activated. Okay. So, you satisfy the physiological needs, you come to the need for uh, safety, security, then you come to belongingness, then you come to self esteem. Okay. And once you are able to uh, know, take care of the D needs, then you move to the B needs. Okay. Now, all these physiological needs they actually you know uh, are cyclic in nature and therefore, physiological needs cannot be completely satisfied. Okay. This is not true in the case of self esteem and safety need of course, can be uh, completely satisfied. But what happens? There is an interesting phenomena that you find also being described in uh, the dynamic approach. Maslow says that under stressful condition or when our survival is threatened, at that time we all regress to our lower needs. Okay. So, suddenly you realize that in the state of threat to survival or extremely stressful condition, okay, people start worrying about their physiological needs, need for security, belongingness and so forth. Now, Maslow says that the satisfaction of self esteem needs produce feeling like self confidence, capability, strength, worth etcetera. And when uh, self esteem needs are thwarted, then it leads to feeling of inferiority, helplessness, weakness. Okay. And of course, we all strive for need for strength, competence, self confidence, independence, mastery, prestige, fame, dominance, dignity, appreciation. Okay. Now, all of them you would find being referred okay, uh, either you go for the trade approach, whether you go for the dynamic approach, okay, even uh, when you go for the behavioristic approach, when you come to humanistic approach, you would realize that irrespective of the approach that different psychologists have taken or the school of thoughts have uh, know, uh, taken a line of action in terms of uh, defining why uh, the personality of individuals gets shaped in a particular way. Okay. By and large the human characteristics does not change, okay. they remain the same. The process of acquisition, why human beings, uh, how do they acquire, why do they reflect this type of uh, characteristics, the approach adopted by different schools of thoughts are little different, but by and large they talk of similar qualities of human beings. We now come to Carl Rogers, the second uh, well, well appreciated person in this uh, school of thought of humanism. Carl Rogers uh, no proposition is called self theory or person centered theory and this primarily is because it is based on his experience as a client centered therapist. He gets the credit for uh, introducing this uh, new method of therapeutic intervention. Now, Roger basically you know talks about the organism okay, which is of utmost importance in his approach. And with organism, he refers to the totality of experience going within that very individual in a particular moment. Okay. So, organism is basically the locus of all experiences that Roger talks about and the totality of experience constitutes both the conscious as well as the unconscious experience. He does talk about the perceptual field or the phenomenal field. And he says that this very field consists of the totality of the experience of that very organism, the individual. And according to Rogers, experiences of phenomenal field are inner experiences okay. and the sources may either be internal, external or it could be both. Now, self has emerged as uh, you know, something which is a byproduct of totality of experience, which is fluid. Okay a changing gestalt. So, self may be either you know uh, in awareness or it could be out of awareness according to Rogers and with the development of self, the growing child, the infant begins to un understand the good and the bad as well as he or she tries to evaluate its experience as positive or negative. So, Rogers says that self is not a uh, no separate dimension of personality and uh, no, the concept of self uh, in the dynamic viewpoint, uh, in the dynamic approach, what the way Freud uh, no, proposed it, Rogers takes a different stand. Okay. 
unlike Freudian uh, viewpoint, he says that self cannot be separated as an independent dimension of personality. An individual does not possess a self, rather self incorporates the whole organism. Rogers also talks about you know, two subsystems of the self, the self concept and the ideal self. Now, all the aspects of experiences which are perceived by the person uh, you know, in awareness that constitutes the self concept, whereas ideal self basically is the experiences related to what one thinks one ought to be or one would like to be. Okay. So, you have the concept of the self okay, which is based on experience, your awareness, your perception whereas, what you would like to be that constitutes your ideal self. Now, once the self concept is formed according to Rogers, changes and further learning becomes difficult. So, those experiences which are inconsistent with the self concept, they are either denied by the individual or they are distorted. And self concept therefore, is different from the real self or the organismic self. It is limited to only those experiences which one is aware of and therefore, organismic self may also include those experiences which are beyond our awareness. Now, he talked about you know, the distortion and denial and distortion and denial basically are you know, the two types of defenses that one would use. Now, distortion would be a case when one misinterprets an experience so as to fit it well into some aspects of self concept. So, you have your self concept with you, there is an experience and then you misinterpret it, this is not the actual interpretation and therefore, it get, gets distorted. Okay. Denial is another uh, format of defense, where the experience is not perceived in awareness at all okay. and distortion of course, it is realized is much more common as compared to denial. So, human beings generously uh, you know, use distortion of the facts of their experiences rather than complete denial of it. And if the amount of anxiety is high, person's defense do not work and his or her personality becomes disorganized. Now, the concept of ideal self is basically equivalent to the concept of superego that Freud had proposed. Ideal self contains all those attributes or characteristics that one aspires to process. And the wider is the gap between the ideal self and the perceived self, okay, it indicates incongruency and psychologically unhealthy personality. So, you see that Carl Rogers viewpoint you know, can uh, even uh, help you understand the healthier side of uh, personality as well as the pathological side of the personality. According to Rogers, every person has an inherent tendency to actualize himself okay, based on the unique potential that they have and self actualization is a growth force that is part of our heredity. Self actualization includes biological potential, but also involves psychological growth and a moving towards maintaining and enhancement of the organism. It gradually develops from simple to complex state and is a dynamic force within us. And according to Rogers, the basic needs that relates to self actualization are the need for positive regard of others and the need for self regard. Okay. So, you need to uh, know regard others as well as you also need to be regarded. So, these are interesting concepts given by the humanistic school of thought. Overall, if you look at the western perspective, you find four different forces. First force which is the Freudian force, second force which is the behavioristic force, third force which is humanism including the European existentialism and the fourth force is the transpersonal psychology. So, these four forces uh, from the western perspective you would realize they have heavily influenced psychology as far as personality is concerned. But what you would realize is that the fourth force has taken cues from the stern philosophy and they have tried to investigate things like meditation, higher level of consciousness and even certain parapsychological phenomena. So, with this we conclude our discussion on the western perspective, but we would definitely like to also talk about the Indian perspective that we would be taking up in the next lecture.